I'm Peter Holland, I'm Associate Dean for the Arts, and each year I organize and then introduce uh, the Saturday Scholars Series. Uh, and it gives me very great pleasure to introduce our two speakers today, not one, but two, uh, and you get them at the same price of admission. <laughs> the second speaker will be Eileen Huntbotting. Hunt Eileen is a professor of political science, and she is the faculty director of the Notre Dame Scholars Program. Uh, she is currently co-teaching a course with our first speaker, Greg Cusich, uh, on Frankenstein in Context, Politics, Science, Literature and Film, which over 60 of our first-year merit scholars in the university-wide uh, Notre Dame Scholars Program are taking as part of their new holistic interdisciplinary first-year curriculum. Uh, Eileen, or Eileen as I'm supposed to call her, I can't help it, that English pronunciation of her first name keeps creeping in, uh, studied at, at Cambridge uh, and at Yale uh, before coming on uh, eventually to Notre Dame in 2001, uh, where amongst other positions she was director of the Gender Studies Program. She was promoted to full professor in political science uh, in 2017. She's the author of six books, uh, including most recently uh, Mary Shelley and the Rights of the Child, Political Philosophy in Frankenstein, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press this year. She organized with Greg Husich and with Professor Augustine Fuentes of the Anthropology Department an international conference on the same topic of today's lecture, Why Frankenstein Matters at 200, and the conference terrible place to have to give, hold a conference was at Notre Dame's Rome Global Gateway in July of 2018. I have to say the last time I was in Rome for a conference, uh, not at the Gateway, uh, it was very striking that though there were an awful lot of people at the conference, very few were ever present at any session. <laughs> Role was not taken and should have been. Greg Cusich uh, did his graduate work at the University of Michigan and then moved all the way down the road to Notre Dame. And this year, astonishingly, marks uh, his 35th year at Notre Dame. Uh, he obviously began uh, as a faculty member at the age of about four. <laughs> his work specializes in work of the, of the English Romantics, uh, particularly Keats, uh, uh, and he's particularly engaged with women's writing of the Romantic period. Numerous books and articles on British Romanticism and currently writing a monograph on British Romanticism and the politics of women's historiography. Uh, this semester, uh, with Professor Botting, uh, he, they have been organizing a series of lectures, films, and readings on campus entitled Operation Frankenstein or as I still think of it, uh, since I love the movie Young Frankenstein, Frankenstein. Please welcome Greg Cusich. Well, thank you, Peter. That was great. Uh, Rome was tough to keep people uh, in their seats there, but we offered them free Frankenstein t-shirts, so that helped out a, a great deal. <laughs> this event is, uh, first of all, we wanted to welcome you uh, to uh, the Saturday Scholars Series, and thank you for being here this morning on such a beautiful football Saturday morning. Uh, we appreciate your attendance you know, very much. Uh, and Peter was telling you about uh, all the events that have been going on this semester uh, in relation to Frankenstein, and this is part of Operation Frankenstein now. Uh, and we have many sponsors for those events, uh, but we'd like particularly to thank the Indiana Humani uh, Humanities Council for sponsoring uh, the various events that we're putting on. Uh, now, actually, there are there are hundreds of Frankenstein events going on around the world right now to celebrate the bicentennial of the publication of Mary, she Mary Shelley's novel, uh, which was begun, as you see up here, in 1816 
at uh, the Villa Diodati, Byron's residence in Geneva, and then published in 1818. You have Mary Shelley States up there uh, as well. She was only 19 years old when she started the novel, which is just incredible to think that a novel of such tremendous impact was begun uh, at such a young age by someone. Uh, and the paramount question that uh, really informs all of the events taking place around the world right now, in which you are now part of as well, is exactly the title uh, of our presentation today, Why Frankenstein Matters at 200. It's a question addressed uh, literally by tens of thousands, being addressed literally by tens of thousands of people around the world right now. We're delighted to be talking about it this morning. Uh, now, the simple answer to that question, if there is a simple answer, is that Frankenstein matters in many, many different ways to our world today because it speaks on uh, such a multiplicity of levels that addresses scholars and students from a huge variety of backgrounds from genetic engineering to artificial intelligence to political science and ethics through the humanities as well. Uh, it's the most widely read novel uh, in um, university culture around the world right now. And I would guess, I think Eileen would agree with me on this, that it's the single most widely read novel this year in particular because of the bicentennial, bicentennial year. Uh, the actual creature from the novel for most of us <clears throat> is connected with this image right here from the James Whale film of 1931, uh, Frankenstein. And when most people think of the word Frankenstein, this is the image that tends to come to mind. We're, re we're wearing little badges here that have this image uh, on our badge. Um, that cre that image is indelibly etched in our popular consciousness in advertisements uh, and all kinds of promos all over the web uh, and everything. But the actual creature from the novel uh, is much different from the creature in the film, even though we admire the film and Frankenstein adaptation films you know, tremendously. The creature in the novel is much more complex. He's much more uh, agile, uh, mobile, certainly intelligent. Uh, this is an image from uh, the 1831 edition of Frankenstein that Mary Shelley prepared herself. And this is the frontispiece. And there's the creature kneeling down up to the right of that image is Victor Frankenstein running out the door of his laboratory in horror at what he's created. But if you look at the creature there, he's actually uh, a very lithe, looking creature uh, and attractive, you know, in many ways. He's got six-pack abs, you know, and looks <laughs> really kind of fantastic. And it's much more um, uh, appropriate or related to the actual creature from the novel who speaks French, reads political philosophy, reads epic poetry, reads novels, uh, and speaks with a degree of eloquent sophistication that is uh, just as complex and maybe even superior to the speech of his creator, Victor Frankenstein. So uh, it's not surprising that given um, the, the complexity of the creature in the novel itself, that there is a, a wide variety of symbolic interpretations of the creature. And, and we tend to call him the creature, not the monster, because uh, there are many sensitive aspects of the creature. He likes uh, birds, for instance, uh, and in uh, theatrical adaptations of the novel, he loves the sunlight, and he kind of reaches out and tries to grab at the sunlight because it moves him uh, so much. Uh, so he's, he's a nice creature in some ways, although he does make some mistakes. And it is true that he does uh, kill some people uh, as well. We're, we're actually hosting a birthday party for the creature on Halloween uh, because he doesn't get a birthday party in the novel uh, at all. So we'll be doing that uh, coming up later this month. Um, 
Of all the issues that could be said about the symbolic resonance of the creature and what his experience signifies, I'm going to focus just on one today, rather briefly, uh, and then you'll be hearing from Professor Bodding in a few minutes about another topic. And the one that I'm going to focus on uh, has to do with the politics of gender the politics of gender as Mary Shelley experienced it uh, in her own time and as it relates to us as well. Mary Shelley was uh, the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft. There she is with her dates there, the famous author of A Vindication of the Rights of Women in 1792 and Mariah, a novel, Mariah or the Wrongs of Women in 1797. Wollstonecraft, if you're not familiar with her, uh, is one of um, history's most important feminist thinkers uh, and writers. Uh, she actually um, uh, died from uh, complications uh, and, and uh, infections giving birth to Mary Shelley. And it's not surprising, and Mary Shelley tremendously admired her feminist writings and her political writings as well. So it's not surprising that the novel Frankenstein would have um, a heavy element of gender concerns in it and would operate in many ways as a gender critique of Mary Shelley's own time. And in the limited time uh, I've got here, I'm just gonna focus on, on, on two aspects of um, the gender issues that emerge from Frankenstein uh, and which speak to our time in some very important and in urgent ways. Uh, in Shelley's time, you, you might be familiar in the late 18th, early 19th century, uh, women had few opportunities for, uh, for independence, for financial independence, for professional lives, and suffered also under marital laws that were extremely uh, oppressive uh, and denying of many of their basic human rights. Uh, and I just want to give you a quick summary of what conditions were like for uh, women during Mary Shelley's uh, lifetime when she's writing the novel. Girls, this is something that Mary Wollstonecraft deals with as well in her writings as well. Uh, girls were not allowed the same kind of education that boys were allowed. Instead of learning uh, the hard subjects, math, sciences, uh, even the humanities, girls tended to be confined in their education to studying uh, or learning dancing, playing a little bit of music, uh, learning to sing, maybe learning a smattering of French or Italian, and basically going to a kind of finishing school or becoming ornaments for the pleasure of men, uh, actually. Women were not allowed to, uh, certainly were not allowed at university as well. They were not allowed to uh, vote or have any participation, any legal participation in public life or national life. Uh, and most of the professions uh, were closed to women, no possibility of entering into any kind of form of financial independence. So it becomes so important for women uh, to get married, to find a husband who will provide them uh, with, uh, with an income and put a roof uh, over their heads. And this is one reason why in Jane Austen novels, uh, so much of the concern in Jane Austen novels is with who's going to marry whom or who's going to be able to attract whom you know, as a husband because there were so few other opportunities for women in Mary Shelley's time. Uh, in effect, women were um, a kind of, um, in a kind of stateless position without any kind of legal identity, particularly in marriage, because in marriage, a woman's legal identity, her political rights, uh, even her financial holdings automatically become subsumed into the um, covering presence of her husband. And there were actually laws uh, called the laws of coverture or covering, uh, which described or particularly delineated the way that a woman's identity literally is submerged within her husband's identity uh, during this historical moment. And there's just one quote I want to give here 
uh, briefly by William Blackstone, who is an important writer on British law in the 18th century, and this explains pretty much what I just said. By marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. That is the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband, under whose wing, protection, and cover, she performs everything and her condition during her marriage is called coverture. So there, there, there are no rights. There's no, virtually no identity in marriage for women, which, which, as I was saying, is one of the only options for women in Shelley's time. You know, as a result, women have, uh, have almost no legal authority um, uh, or legal recourse to develop independent lives. Women are even trapped in abusive marriages and are not able to leave even abusive marriages uh, legally. Mary Wollstonecraft refers to the state of marriage as the state of prison uh, in her vindication of uh, the rights of women. Uh, and in the wrongs of women as well. Uh, and she also speaks of the legal condition of women during her time as equivalent legally to the condition of West Indian slaves. Not, not, not the same in actual physical manifestation, but in terms of law, women have no more rights than African slaves do. Now, this is the condition, just moving along a little quickly, this is the condition of the creature in Frankenstein. We tend to think of the creature who's eight feet tall as, as, as hyper-masculine, and he is in many ways, but the creature exists on many different symbolic levels. This is one of the things we've been emphasizing to our students, the, the many different ways the creature can be understood. And surprisingly, and uh, in an amazingly complex way, the creature can be understood uh, symbolically within the subject position of a woman, in which he's an outcast, from society, he has no state, he has no rights, he has no legal rights of any kind, uh, he's judged by his appearance uh, completely, uh, people run from him in terror, uh, not looking for the subjectivity that's within the creature as well. And there are a number of other details in the novel that uh, I won't go into that link the creature with um, Mary, with uh, the condition of women during Mary Shelley's time, the uh, unjust condition of, w of women, which Mary Wollstonecraft called the wrongs of women. So in many ways, the novel can be considered as a sustained critique of the gender systems, the unjust and abusive gender systems and laws of Mary Shelley's time with the creature's anguish in his outcast state uh, representing the condition of stateless women without legal rights and without identity, legal identity even. Uh, so that's one point that can be talked about in much more detail. The second point I wanted to mention, and I'm moving toward a, a conclusion here now. The second point is the um, what we might call the social and the legal inability of women uh, to speak out about these abuses and injustices, to speak out about the wrongs of women. There's one critical episode in uh, Frankenstein where one of the female characters, Justine Moritz, is uh, accused, wrongly accused, of committing murder. Uh, she pleads her innocence Victor Frankenstein's fiance, Elizabeth, uh, reinforces this plea and gives a long character uh, reference for her. This is all in a court of law. And we know as readers of the novel that she's actually innocent. Something's going off here. <laughs> Don't know what that is. <laughs> it's it's not my phone. I'll try to I'll try to talk over it.
Oh, it just stopped. Whatever it was, it just stopped. Maybe that was some inspiration from the past, you know, that, that was coming in. Or some correction saying, what are you saying, really? That's, that's the one advantage of writing about authors who lived 200 years ago. You know, they can't come back uh, at you, you know, and say, it's, that's not it at all. <laughs> but um, this episode is um, so uh, tragic catastrophically tragic and so moving uh, in the novel because Justine, the character who's accused wrongly of murder, is eventually executed. Uh, she's not listened to in a court of law or within a patriarchal system, just as Elizabeth um, is not listened to, and just as the creature is not listened to by anyone who encounters him, except uh, the one figure, the elderly de Lacy figure, who is blind, who can't judge him by his looks. So another way of thinking of um, the creature's symbolic resonance in the novel and the elements of, um, of social criticism in the novel is to think of, of Mary Shelley severely critiquing uh, what we might call the silencing, the patriarchal, or the silencing of women under legal systems of patriarchy in her time. Uh, now, now, just to conclude here uh, and to bring this up to the 21st century, uh, our own time you know, has obviously advanced considerably in relation to uh, the politics of gender since Mary Shelley's time. Uh, but I think we'd all agree that there are still all kinds of systems of inequality and injustices that women are um, uh, subject to in our time, from glass ceilings to unequal pay to limited promotion opportunities for women to the persisting tendency uh, that exists in a major way still in our society to objectify women according to their appearance. There's still a long, long way to go um, uh, from uh, as much as we've come from Mary Shelley's time. Now, secondly, regarding the second issue I brought up of the silencing of women in legal systems, I think we only need to attend to the Me Too movement today and to what's been in the press constantly having to do with the Supreme Court hearings to know how much that issue still remains with us urgently today. So just on these two points alone, just briefly, Mary Shelley has volumes to say uh, to us now in our time now and the critiques that she levels about her own uh, historical moment and I think we bear a strong responsibility and so do all of our students and scholars working on the same topic and anyone interested in Frankenstein a strong responsibility to uh, listen seriously to what she has to say. Okay, thank you. Great. Why does Frankenstein matter at 200? As a political theorist, this question can only be answered in relation to the most urgent political and moral issues of our own time. Mary Shelley's novel matters if it can speak to those issues and help us address them. If we agree with Harvard University political theorist Michael Sandel that we are living in, quote, the age of genetic engineering, then we must consider the ethics and politics of the making of artificial life and intelligence to stand at the very top of the most compelling issues of the 21st century. Do human creatures at any stage of development have a right either to be or not to be genetically modified uh, by biotechnology for the sake of the quality of life Political theorists in the 21st century, including Sandel, have typically ar argued for the human embryo's right not to be genetically modified in the germline because such heritable changes would change humanity in inalterable and unforeseeable ways, if not destroy the species and its morality and culture altogether. This prohibitive answer to the to be or not to be question 
is problematic with regard to human germline genetic engineering for two reasons. First, it treats human germline genetic engineering as if it is a matter of science fiction to be avoided and thereby ignores the fact that 100 or more children have been genetically modified in the germline through three-person IVF, also known as mitochondrial replacement therapy, since 1997. And that many more designer babies will be born in the near future through biotechnologies such as CRISPR-Cas9. Second, it fails to take into account the rights of genetically modified children and other bioengineered creatures in the present tense. First and foremost, the right to live, love, and flourish as members of the human community that brought them to life in the first place. Following Mary Shelley, I will focus on how this right to be genetically modified or otherwise bioengineered applies primarily to creatures during childhood rather than to creatures before birth or during adulthood. By childhood, I mean the time of life between birth and adulthood. By child, I mean any person living in the stage of childhood. This is a purely political definition of the child, made without reference to any divisive, unsupported scientific ideas or deep and demanding moral, metaphysical, or religious doctrines. Given its fluidity, this political definition of the child should travel well across cultures and legal systems, covering all known cases of children worldwide. We need such a basic yet broad political definition of a child to serve as a guide for focusing international attention on the question of the rights of the children actually made and born due to genetic engineering. Overcoming the systematic bias in bioethics toward the early embryo and against the child will require much more than a workable political definition of the child, however. It will require an imaginative leap, which Frankenstein can push us to entertain. Frankenstein opened in an imaginative frame for focusing upon the rights of the bioengineered child after birth through a cascade of highly innovative plot points. First, Shelley eliminates pregnancy from the creature's reproductive circumstances forcing the reader to focus on his life after birth, not before it. This omission of woman from the reproductive process and its disastrous results signals the high value that Mary Shelley placed on women's vital role in mothering children and building healthy communities in society. This omission also enables the story to function as a devastating feminist critique of the historic failure of men like Victor Frankenstein, to step up to fulfill intensively loving, caring, and dutiful roles as parents. Due to the reproduction of the creature without fertilization of gametes or gestation in a woman's womb, the novel also allows readers to conceptualize the bioengineered child as an independent entity, physically separate from a mother, a father, or any parent from the very moment of animation. Secondly, Shelley endowed the creature with extraordinary powers to physically survive independently of his parent after birth. She gave the newborn creature an eight-foot frame, incredible strength and endurance, superhuman speed, and such rapid of cognitive and linguistic development that he teaches himself to read Milton's Paradise Lost before the age of two. <laughs> In contrast, to vulnerable newborn babies who would die without an intensively loving caregiver to satisfy their needs, the creature's superhuman powers enable him to survive exposure after birth and to live separately from a neglectful parent. As a consequence, the physical separation between the creature and his parent persists long after the unprecedented circumstances of his birth without a womb, a pregnancy, or an egg. By holding the creature's physical independence constant from the very onset of life, Shelley's literary thought experiment invites the reader to assess the effect 
of extreme physical independence on a child's affective development. Running this thought experiment, the reader finds that the persisting physical and social isolation of the creature correlates with the growth of his longing for a close emotional relationship with a parent or other loving friend or companion. Thirdly, Shelley places at the narrative core of the novel the 21-month-old creature's devastating story of surviving his exposure after birth. The creature recounts to Frankenstein how he suffered total abuse by society due to the bioengineered deformity that drove his father scientist to abandon him as soon as he came to life. Frankenstein is initially moved to help his creature, but ultimately fails to respond to the cries of his child. Eavesdropping, as it were, on this emotional confrontation between the scientist and his abandoned creature, the reader has the opportunity to sympathize with the plight of an abused and neglected child of biotechnology, exposed at birth due to what his father construed as a deformity in his creation's face. At the conclusion of this dramatic meeting of maker and child on the Mer de Glace, the creature demands of his father scientists the fulfillment of his right to live in the interchange of those sympathies necessary for my being. A survivor of total neglect and abuse, the 21-month-old creature articulates a rationally and emotionally compelling rights claim toward his derelict parent for the fulfillment of his right to share love and community with another. By hearing the creature, by feeling compassion for his howls of pain, and by grappling with the pull of his reasonable arguments, 21st century readers can better put into words and articulate in international legal practice a new political right. A new political right is a strikingly original and creative rights claim that is articulated in fresh and updated terms in relation to current and past politics, laws, and cultures. By engaging the politics of children's rights in light of the recent history of genetic engineering and the cultural legacy of Shelley's Frankenstein, we are well situated to articulate such a new political right, the child's right to be genetically modified, meaning to have been genetically modified, and subsequently to live, love, and flourish as such between birth and adulthood in conditions of non-discrimination with regard to reproductive circumstances and genetic features. It is the converse of the embryo's right not to be genetically modified for it takes as a given the existence of genetically modified children or children who are GMOs and imagines with the help of the creature's plea to his father what it would take for them to thrive as GMO children. It is valid to compare the creature with GMO children today, but only with respect to their circumstances of reproduction. It would be wrong to suggest that GMO children like Alana Sarinen, one of the first children made through three-person IVF, are identical to the creature, who becomes a murderer due to his worst-case scenario of total abuse and, and neglect as a child. It is politically apt, however, to compare the creature with GMO children because their similar circumstances of reproduction yield similar potential for hurtful experience of discrimination, neglect, and abuse. There are seven aspects of the creature's character that arise from his reproductive circumstances. Together and separately, these seven aspects show the creature's rough social and medical similarities to GMO children today. The creature is a child who is either a hybrid or chimera, made through a type of artificial reproductive technology from the parts of donors in a laboratory setting and modified through a biotechnological intervention by a scientist in order to be perfected in a set of features. 
The 100 or more genetically modified children made by three-person IVF since 1997 fit all seven of these criteria. Most notably, they are genetic chimeras with the DNA of three zygotes with greater longevity due to the elimination of deadly or debilitating genetic diseases. Beyond their circumstances of reproduction, what the creature and GMO children share most profoundly in common is being, meaning living, as a bioengineered child. Honing in on life after birth, Shelley permits the infinitive to be. In the question, is there a right of the child to be genetically modified, to be read in the present tense? As in, is there a right of the child to be or to live as a GMO creature? The story of the artificially made and modified creature suggests that children's rights are in fact the most fundamental form of rights because each and every person, regardless of origins, features, or capacities, begins life as we know it after birth as an emotionally vulnerable child. These fundamental rights of the child include, first and foremost, a right to share love with parents or fitting substitutes, for such a relationship of love is critical for children's healthy and happy development. Shelley's creature put this philosophical point in poetic terms when he claimed in relation to his father scientist a right as a child to live in the interchange of those sympathies necessary for my being. Without experiencing a sympathetic exchange or reciprocal relationship of love with a parent or fitting substitute, the creature fails to emotionally thrive, as any young child would, despite his ability to physically survive on his own. The novel's central thought experiment shows readers that while biotechnology may change some of the circumstances behind the parent-child relationship, including conditions of physical vulnerability and dependency, it cannot eliminate the issue of the responsibility of parents towards the children whom they make and raise, although he is not biologically related to his creature. Victor is primarily responsible for him as the sole parent who brought him to life. So too are all parents responsible for the children under their primary care, no matter how those children came to be under it. Even as Shelley's novel explores the deep primary responsibility of all parents towards their children, especially to share love with them, it also presents, true to the Gothic form, the consequences of failing to fulfill that duty, or if unfit or incapable, to find someone else to fulfill it. In the face of parental failure to provide, or at least arrange for, a fitting substitute to fulfill a child's right to conditions of loving care, what shall be done? The story of the stateless and orphaned creature's failed quest across borders to find any community to support him is a kind of reverse Gothic image of what politically ought to be the case. By presenting a worst case scenario of child exposure and abuse, the novel presses the reader to ask the still visionary question, what are the obligations of states and international political bodies toward children without parents or any family to lovingly care for them? At the same time, the story of the creature presses readers to challenge biologically deterministic accounts of what it means to be a human, a child, to love, or to hold rights. GMO children who have been made from three-person IVF are not unhuman or non-human, but rather, quote, a new form of human being, unquote, according to the biologist Paul Knopfler. The same may be said of the creature. While he is seen and treated as a savage and a monster, he was actually designed by Victor as a human being made from the parts of corpses of humans and other animals in order to display distinctive features. In Mary Shelley's spirit of sharing sympathies with Frankenstein's creature, we should become more attentive to the perspectives, health, and well-being of GMO children. 
The 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child provides a promising framework for articulating the rights of the GMO child in what political theorist Charles Bites has called the practice of international law and politics. The CRC's preamble states that each child for the full and harmonious development of his or her personality should grow up in a family environment in an atmosphere of happiness, love, and understanding. Part one, article two, specifies non-discrimination rights, including rights to non-discrimination toward disability, birth, or other status. And part one, article seven, specifies rights to a name, birth registration, nationality, and as far as possible, to know and be cared for by his or her parents. While the CRC's language can and should justify highly specific legal constructions of children's rights with regard to artificial reproductive technology, such as a child's right to know gamete donors or surrogates, it also allows for further articulation of fundamental rights for GMO and non-GMO children alike. First, children's right to share love with parents or fitting substitutes. And secondly, children's right to non-discrimination on the basis of birth, including reproductive circumstances and genetic features. The first of these fundamental rights of the child could be articulated in a way that would address children's welfare rights worldwide, including the development of a web of national and, inter and international safety nets to catch and protect parentless, loveless, or stateless children like Frankenstein's creature. The second of these fundamental rights would entail the articulation of non-discrimination law on the national and international stage, such that it covers reproductive circumstances and genetic features. Non-discrimination laws, policies, and cultures could then protect the political rights of children who are genetically engineered including genetic chimeras or part human chimeras, plus the political rights of other young creatures, such as the genetically modified mice, pigs, and monkeys who serve as subjects in scientific research on genetic engineering. Thank you. I'll be very happy to take your questions, uh, not only about the relevance of Frankenstein uh, to the ethics and politics of genetic engineering, but also other artificial life forms, such as artificial intelligence. And if you enjoyed uh, my lecture, I uh, hope you might find interesting an essay that I just published uh, last week in um, the online uh, Journal of Ideas, uh, Eon Magazine. Uh, and uh, I'll see if I can go to the link to show you uh, where it is on the internet. Uh, but if not, um, you can find it on the Eon website. Thank you very much. Professor Kusich and I can now take any questions you have. The dates you gave for Mary Wallenstein, she died in 79, her oh. works were published in that, that, was a, that was a typo. Oh, that was, uh, that was backwards, actually. She died in 1997. Okay. Was the second so question I had was on the law of coverture. That was true in England. What about in the continent? Was that true, is that true under the Napoleonic Code or in the Spanish Empire and other parts of uh, Europe? Uh, good question. Um, there were variations, I know, in France, in particular during the French Revolution about the rights of women in the beginning. Uh, women were not given, in the beginning of the French Revolution, women were not given the right to vote, for instance. And then later on, in the more radical stages of the revolution, they were. But things changed in France uh, and flipped in different ways. In Spain, I can't really say for sure, although I would expect that in Spain, things would have been even more oppressive than in England. Yeah, yeah I think that's uh, correct. Uh, throughout the Napoleonic era, women's rights were basically crushed uh, across Europe, um, Britain, um, and, uh, and to some degree in the United States, which was more progressive overall. But um, until the late um, 1790s, uh, women in New Jersey could actually vote. 
uh, due to a legal, legal loophole that didn't specify gender um, uh, with regard to voting rights, and that was, uh, that was shut down around 1800. Uh, so there was uh, a kind of uh, backlash against women's rights across um, Europe and North America during the Napoleonic era. Yeah, it's really not until you start to get to the middle of the Victorian period, the middle of the 19th century and onwards, that you start getting some of these laws loosened up, laws of uh, marital suppression of women loosened up. And of course, the vote suffragette movement is beginning in the later 19th century and early 20th century. So it's about 100 years, really, after Mary Shelley before things start to loosen up at all. Other questions? Yeah, please. Treat me as I'm completely ignorant, because I am. Uh, GMO children, you said some of them have been created? Yes, um, 100, uh, at least uh, 100 uh, have been estimated uh, to have been born since 1997. So uh, the oldest generation of them are in college right now. Uh, and um, a number have been interviewed uh, in uh, the media. Um, not, not many, but uh, two or three have given public interviews. Uh, uh, the most famous is the, the one I mentioned in my talk, Alana Sarenin, um, from Michigan. Uh, and uh, around 1997, 1998 or so, uh, she was born. Um, uh, and um, uh, she was interviewed by the BBC a few years ago. Um, she was also featured in the New York Times Magazine piece on uh, children made from three-person IVF. Uh, so uh, uh, when I started doing the research for this, I was really um, a surprise too. I said, well, why, why, why isn't this more widely discussed? that children um, have been uh, genetically engineered in the germline, as inheritably. Uh, and um, it's interesting, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it was, you know, obviously uh, chronicled in the medical journals. I put the uh, slide up with the uh, article from The Lancet, one of the most famous medical journals of all time. It actually features in the film uh, Young, Young Frankenstein, uh, if you remember. Uh, and um, so, uh, um, it was, of course, documented in all the scientific and medical journals. Why, 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 why isn't it uh, more widely known in popular culture and politics? Um, I don't really know the answer to that, um, although if you Google it when you get home, you'll find there, there are many articles in newspapers chronicling um, uh, the various techniques of three-person IVF, um, uh, even discussions of the, the ethics of uh, uh, um, making such um, heritable changes uh, to the human genome. Um, uh, but um, uh, in, in um, Britain, um, uh, uh, we should see a, uh, a rise in the number of children made by um, mitochondrial repl replacement therapy uh, because it's been legalized there um, to help prevent the passage of uh, deadly or debilitating mitochondrial diseases. Um, but only for that purpose in Britain. Um, they have not legalized it as a fertility treatment in Britain. It's, it's only legal for those uh, mothers who run the risk of passing a deadly or debilitating mitochondrial disease um, uh, to their, to their um, offspring. Now, do these children, oh, I'm sorry. Yep, you can follow up. Do, do these children have any characteristic that, that makes them sort of stand out in society? Uh, no, no, they wouldn't. No, of course not. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, the film uh, Gattaca. Um, uh, we're going to show it in our Frankenstein film series this semester over at the um, uh, DeBartolo um, Arts Center. Um, but in that film from 1997, um, uh, uh, there we, uh, in the near future, um, is imagined a, a society in which um, uh, a whole cast of people has been engineered to be um, uh, uh, perfect, you know, in, in uh, health and appearance and so on. Uh, and then an, an underclass has been left to uh, reproduce the old-fashioned way. Uh, and uh, the two segments of society are called the, the, the valids and the invalids, right? The valids are the genetically engineered and the invalids are the non-genetically engineered. But what the film does so brilliantly, if you've never seen it, you should go, go watch it when you get home, is it, it actually makes it completely unclear who's who. And, 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 and the, 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 the invalids can pass as valids. Um, and and the, the film actually chronicles an invalid passing as a valid um, and actually exceeding 
the, uh, the abilities of the so-called valids. Um, so um, I, I, I use this example to illustrate that, um, uh, that in general, we, we, we shouldn't expect to see many differences, right, between, say, those who have been genetically engineered and those who have not, uh, because we're all human. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, maybe it, it's possible, right, over you know, millennia that you would see dramatic differences, right? Um, but that would take time, and we, we can't predict how that, would, how that would transpire down the evolutionary line. Um, uh, but in the here and now, no. Um, although the, the articles in the New York Times Magazine and the BBC um, uh, also interviewed the parents of some of these children, and the parents often said, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for um, having been able to receive this treatment, it gave me my child, um, and my child has incredibly good health. And they, they talk about, you know, my child never gets a cold. <laughs> and so if there was any benefit, right, you know, in, that you would notice, like as a parent, it would be, my kid seems to be overall quite healthy <laughs> compared to other kids. But no, could you tell any difference between them and the street? Of course not. Yeah. Question up here. Yeah? What, what happens to, to the GMO children that aren't uh, perfect uh, before birth, that were like no scientist would bat a thousand? What happens to those? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th that's a great question. Well, I mentioned a biologist, uh, Paul Knopfler, who's at um, University of California, um, Davis. Uh, he has a really good book that I highly recommend um, called uh, GMO Sapiens. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm riffing on his term um, in talking about GMO children. Um, and uh, in that book, GMO Sapiens, uh, he, uh, he talks about some of the early cases when they used uh, um, some techniques of three-person IVF that are, are now no longer used because they were deemed unsafe. Um, in our country in 2001, one particular early technique called OO plasmic transfer which was used as a fertility treatment in the late 1990s, and um, probably was the technique used to generate Alana Serena in her peer group. Um, that technique has been, was halted, not banned, but halted in use by the FDA around 2001. But by that point, at least 20 or more children had already been registered as born in this country through that technique, and we don't know how many were produced around the world. Um, so, uh, um, but that technique was deemed unsafe and there were some embryos that were produced that were, um, uh, uh, you know, had um, uh, deformities or um, uh, you had developmental disorders um, and uh, either they just didn't make it, you know, in the fertility treatment process um, uh, or you know, I, 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 a lot of the documentation is not clear, but it, it's possible, you know, some parents elected not to carry the pregnancies through. I saw a term before, pregnancy wastage, the ones that weren't perfect were either experiment or on or, or just yeah. flushed away. Right, right. you don't want to sell a full defect of product. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, and, and, and Knopfler, um, uh, actually devotes a lot, as a biologist to his credit, devotes a lot of time to analyzing the ethics of just this question. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, when, we're, when we're talking about the <coughs> generation of, um, of human embryos um, in a research or experimental context, we have to be very careful about um, sorting them out as though there's a difference, right? Um, a kind of qualitative difference between them in terms of their right to, to live. Right, um, and I think that we, we have to be very careful about that and educate parents and fertility patients about, about the ethics of these choices <coughs> they're making. Um, uh, I do know now, compared to the late 1990s, that, um, uh, the norm in uh, reproductive ethics is to um, make um, as few embryos as necessary. Um, not to make spare embryos. And I think that's been a huge change in the way that fertility treatments have been conducted over, say, the last 20 to 30 years. Yeah. Is this happening so fast that it's ahead of regulating it? <clears throat> Yeah. Oh yes, yes, yeah. It's a great, it's a great question. Uh, I, I, I think that that's exactly why I'm uh, working on this topic. I, I think that we need to um, develop better regulation um, of uh, various processes of the artificial creation of life. Um, 
Uh, and, uh, I would also include AI under this banner um, of needing greater attention to the ethical and legal regulation of the artificial creation of life. Um, and I, I don't think any society in the world currently is doing enough. Um, I think we're beginning to wake up. I, interestingly, it's engagement with Frankenstein that has really sparked a lot of interest in this topic now. I just read in the New York Times um, uh, just last week, there's an article about the ethics of making a AI. And um, researchers from around the world are actually pointing to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as a kind of ethical model for thinking through you know, what's right and wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but and, particularly because in Frankenstein, there is no regulation, of course, of any sorts, so and that's part of the whole problem. You know, the victor doesn't speak to anyone, or doesn't get any advice, or doesn't consult or consider the morality, <coughs> the ethics of this at all. So the whole thought experiment, if we want to use that talk, is about the need for those kinds of issues. That's, I think that's why the novels become, one of the reasons why it's become so urgent today in these kinds of <coughs> Yeah, well, we need, we need loads more regulation, and not just regulation, we need ethical regulation. So what we need are um, people who are informed about ethics, um, shaping laws and policies in their communities and their countries. So in other words, we need people like you who care about these topics, who speak up about these issues, you know, back home and, uh, and shape the, the legislation and the policies and the educational systems that, you know, enable us to do this right rather than wrong. Uh, yeah. I, I, I missed most of your lecture, so I apologize, but, so maybe you discuss this, but of course Frankenstein is itself an allegory of how to grapple with technology, which in her day was electricity mm -hmm. and the evolution of medicine, particularly in Scotland. So maybe you could just talk about that briefly? Uh, well, grappling with technology goes hand in hand with what we were just talking right, about, obviously. actually about how uh, Victor Frankenstein develops the technology. We don't know exactly what it is, of course, but he develops the technology to do something that no one else has ever done before, but never engages. One of the things that we always talk about uh, in relation to Victor Frankenstein is his isolation, uh, and the isolation that's caused by his compulsive obsessiveness with creating life that cuts him off from life, ironically, from life around him everywhere and from social systems and certainly from legal systems. So there's never in the novel any the slightest kind of consideration on Victor Frankenstein's part about the consequences of his actions or the ethical issues that are raised by his actions. And I think that's just one of the main critiques that Mary Shelley's raising about engaging in a new technology without um, without having those kinds of discussions and debates. Uh, you mentioned, and I agree entirely, that the legal, regulatory, and ethical standards need to be developed. Is, there a, is that an international effort, or is that a Western, or is that a Chinese, or yeah. Arabic, yeah. or is yeah. it just the Western ethical? Yeah. Um, well, that, that's, that's a great question. Um, uh, at our conference uh, in Rome this summer, we had the philosopher David Archard from, uh, from Belfast, Ireland uh, as, as a speaker. And um, he is the head of the Nuffield Bioethics Council in um, the UK. Um, and they just put out a uh, paper this summer arguing for the need for um, not just international legal regulation, but actually an international bill of rights pertaining to um, uh, bioengineered children. Um, and so there is an international movement now um, led by thinkers such as David Archard to do exactly this. Uh, is there buy-in from other cultures to that? Um, well, I think that that is the goal. And I think that's why Nuffield argued it has to be international and probably um, uh, promoted by the United Nations in particular. Um, China has been at the forefront of um, experimentation in genetic engineering. Um, but it's infamous for, for um, uh, being uh, a bit maverick in what it, what it allows. Um, and so some of the more dangerous uh, techniques have been tested there first, ironically, by US doctors. So um, the US um, is not the, uh, the white hat here. In many cases, it's our doctors and our scientists who travel to China to test things that may be unsafe on human beings 
um, without regulation. Um, and so um, that's why I agree with Professor Achard. We have to make this an international moral and political task. Let me reassure you, no humans were genetically modified for the making of Saturday scholars. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Eileen and Greg. For